Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, hope you're having a good time, enjoying some of the, the scenery and the knowledge sharing. Uh, got some uh, slides here, or well, some photos and some information about skiing in Norway. And I'll just, uh, I'll bring that up now on the screen. Okay. So this is uh, a map of Norway and the locations I'll be showing some photos of and providing a bit of info on are marked here, starting with uh, near Olesund on the coast, Harund Fjord and the Sunmore Alps, a little bit further to the north, Romsdalen, and then up further up towards the north here, the Lofoten Islands and in northern Norway, up around Tromsø, above the Arctic Circle. So Harunfjorden and the Sundmeyer Alps, a uh, very famous place for backcountry skiing and mountaineering, uh, popular in the summer as well. The town of Olesund is up here, and you can fly into Olesund, there's an airport on one of the adjoining islands, and then what we did here was jump on a boat, um, a converted Swedish minesweeper, which was quite roomy and comfortable. And they sailed down along here and then through the Harun Fjord. And then the boat was basically our accommodation and uh, meals and transport for the duration of this trip. And the peaks we skied were all, as you can see on the map there, in the, in the vicinity of the Harun Fjord. So getting straight into the action, Skarasalen. Uh, so we started down at Sayebo here, driven up to a trailhead here and then started skiing um, up the valley and then onto the, the ridge line and then up to the summit of Skarasalen. And then the beauty of having the boat was, instead of skiing back down the same way, we were able to go down fresh snow right down all the way and skied within a few hundred metres of the fjord and then hiked to the rest to get picked up by a dinghy and then taken back to the boat. Here's the boat, the Gastan, uh, a wooden boat, decommissioned in 1974. And on the trip, uh, this was a guided trip, the guide standing in the background here, a couple of Swedish guys on board and then myself and Roger Palmer. This was our first day on skis. So here we are heading off up, up the trail, enjoying the, um, the scenery, and then climbing up through the forest. Well, small trees here actually, not really forest. Um, you can see a little bit of avalanche activity over the other side. So uh, certainly pays to uh, have some local knowledge about where you're going. Uh, some marvellous country there, marvellous vistas, expansive views and heaps of skiing. There's really only one ski resort in this area of Norway and it's some distance from here. So we're skiing up higher now. The guide leading the way. And then from the summit, uh, we've got some fresh snow and uh, we're able to ski, you know, in knee deep powder. You can see the expanse of the Alps, the Sunmore Alps and around the vicinity here. So scanning down, we got this bonus uh, unfresh, untracked snow, fresh snow, as you can see dropping off down there, down that, uh, the, down the gully to the right. And as we went down, the snow got a bit gluggy, so it wasn't powder the whole way. And at the bottom, we had to sort of hoof it down through some, uh, some light snow and rocks. And then walk around the fjord to get picked up in the dinghy. Everyone happy, big day out. And back to the boat for a few beers and some dinner. 
And that's an example of some of the scenery you'll see around the coast. Uh, small Swedish uh, Norwegian villages tucked away. Some of these are inaccessible or very difficult to access by roads. So the next peak, probably the highlight of this whole trip, Slogan. Slogan is the giant of the King of Sunmore. And you'll see why in a minute. We started at the bottom here, got driven up in a trailer behind a tractor and unloaded up the trailhead and then skied some distance up the valley behind the mountain. And skiing up this valley, uh, when you realize that slogan there on the right, the first thought is how the hell am I ever going to ski up or down that? It really is dramatic mountain. Getting a bit closer here, everyone's still wondering where the ski route is. And you can see some tracks from the previous day up, up ahead of us there as well. And uh, there's the mountain coming in underneath it fresh snow still, so uh, some very, very, really good skiing around. And here we are close to the top of Slogan with the view back down the fjord. So we started down at that grassy farmland in this vicinity here. And uh, we're looking across the Alps. Garasal and that other peak was over here. A few shots from the summit looking across at other peaks in the Sunmore Alp. Some of them climbing peaks, obviously not skiing. And here's Roger and I at the summit of Slogan. Very airy summit, this one. I don't think uh, not everybody makes it to the top. It's pretty scary. And then the ski descent was magic. There you can see the ski slope. So this is on the backside of the mountain where there actually is a slope and at the top, uh, it's death defying. And uh, most people would be happy to walk the last bit and then enjoy the uh, fresh tracks on the way down with the guide who was uh, unsurprisingly an expert skier showing us all how, it, how it's done. And then at the bottom, Ronnie, the one of the Swedish guides uh, and I had a swim in the fjord, which was uh, very refreshing, actually not far above zero. <laughs> and the mountain is uh, so famous in the area, they've got a beer named after it. And we had a few of these beers and a nice dinner at a little lodge down by the fjord, cooked up a big barbecue in there and kicked back at the end of the day. And this is uh, Ronnie, the Swedish guy again, skiing off another peak in the area. This one's Collis Tinden, uh, another really good summit and another really good ski run. I think we were lucky with the snow, there'd been some fresh snow. So being springtime, you might be getting spring snow conditions, but we actually had really nice snow. So moving to an area slightly to the north now of um, the Sunmore Alp is an area known as Romsdalen. And this is famous for both cross country and back country skiing. There's a cross country trail network and a number of ski peaks. For those that are into climbing, the troll wall is also here, which is the famous uh, vertical wall, multi-day climbing venue. And the troll road is a very famous tourist attraction. It's actually closed by snow over the winter. It wasn't opened at the time we were there, but that's got uh, some dramatic switchbacks and things for, for cycling or for just driving, in fact. The peaks we skied up in this area were Jurid Tinden over on the right and Blaneba, just above the town of Ondolznes. So this is uh, skiing up Jurid Tinden. Another big ascent, actually similar to Slogan in some ways. Um, some quite icy sections. We were using uh, ski crampons and uh, skins to get to the top. And this was a Finnish guy that we teamed up with on the way to uh, 
he was on his own, so he tagged along with us, and uh, yeah, we had a we had a pretty good run. Good ski up, and then from the top, a good ski down. So this the peak on this one was uh, technical climbing, so we just got to the highest point on the slope that we could comfortably ski. And this mountain that you see from the valley and around about is known as Romsdale Hornet. And uh, the Norwegian guy that we bumped into and skied with informed us that uh, somebody actually climbed this mountain after a Bucks party some time ago, 60 years ago, and said they climbed it. Nobody believed them. Um, it later, when it was climbed by someone with technical gear, they got to the top and found a can. So it turned out the original story was true. Not a ski mountain, this one though. So the other peak in the area, the town at the bottom there is, is the good base. Some good gear shops, cafes, restaurants. Uh, this was a two or three hour ski to get to the summit of this one. Some really steep drop offs on the left and then a, a reasonably steep icy ridge to get down to. Really nice skiing and great views with our Norwegian friend. And that's looking across to the troll wall in the background here. This is the famous multi-pitch alpine wall. So from a distance, it doesn't look so big, but when you get to the bottom, it's uh, very daunting. So moving up further to the north of Norway, um, inland you've got the major town of Narvik, but the Lofoten Islands is a chain of islands. Um, four main ones, but also a lot of smaller ones, and they're connected by road bridges or tunnels. And the dots there are all locations that we skied with a guided group. Uh, the advantage in having the guided group is that they provide transport, they provide uh, meals, and the guides are very clued up about what the weather's doing. This is a maritime climate here, so you can get a lot of storms coming through. And uh, this was in spring, April. The, um, the weather in this area is known to be problematic. So having a good weather window is important, but also having guides to take you to exactly the right place at the right time can make or break the trip. And cost-wise, I don't think it works out to be a lot more. So on the night we arrived, I had two things I wanted to see. The second one we'll see in a little while, but the first one was the Northern Lights. And let me tell you, it is everything it's cracked up to be. Absolutely spellbinding. Um, if you get a chance to see it, I can recommend it. At transition time of year, as the midnight sun arrives, the Northern Lights are no longer visible. So I think we're very lucky to see this. Only lasted for 15 minutes. So I was in Norway for a month and didn't see it again. And they're not static. They're moving around like a gas jet. Swishing and swirling and shooting overhead. So first day on skis in the Lofoten Islands. Um, the skiing is generally not too difficult, but the scenery is as amazing as you can see. And in the background here, there is the, the town of Svalvea, which is one point where the ferries stop. Um, it's a local, it's probably the biggest town on Lofoten Islands and up behind it, some good skiing. This is our guide, George, Scottish, um, leading us up. And our other guide, James, going through some snow pits and checking out layers, etc and then scoping out the descent. So everyone on this trip was on, <coughs> excuse me, on Alpine Touring Gear. And that's a panorama shot from that location, the top of the mountain called Vard. And there is a small ski resort down closer to Svalve, but the back country here is, uh, is absolutely astounding on a good day. And the snow was quite good up high a little bit wet down lower. Mm -hmm. 
And here's another, uh, here's another trip, uh, another mountain. Uh, this one was called Helos Dinden. A bit technical finding our way up onto it, but a really nice ski descent coming down. And uh, people are happy, very happy, a big day out. This was on uh, two peaks for the price of one. You climb one, ski it, and then pop up the other one and then come back down, back down to the fjord there. This is uh, from the summit of South Tindon. <laughs> Looking across the pier land on the right. And back down at the fjords. And then a nice ski run down, back down to the road for the waiting transport, which was a couple of vans. And after the guided trip, Roger and I did some peaks as well in the area before heading up north. This one was Runfjellet, uh, a really airy summit. And down there is the uh, airstrip, small airstrip on the Lofoten Islands in the distance. Marvellous skiing and not, not actually death defying. This one was probably the most difficult of the trip, quite steep at the top and intimidating. So we, uh, we didn't make it to the summit and uh, the weather clagged out. So we satisfied ourselves with skiing about three quarters of the run and we'd started at the bottom there and then hiked up to get to the ribbons of snow and then continued up and uh, often in Norway you'll see these signs from moose I was very very keen to see a moose but they're actually not that common but we got lucky and spotted one by the side of the road giant animals and surprisingly agile so absolutely marvelous to see if you get if you're lucky enough. Another feature of the Lofoten Islands is uh, the dried cod. It's everywhere. And here they are hanging up on racks and uh, local delicacies and meals and things incorporate them. So moving up to the north of Norway, there's a series of uh, locations here that I'll go th show some pics of. Um, the weather up here was changeable, so we didn't have good weather every day. Crossing to islands is sometimes by these roll-on, roll-off ferries or tunnels or bridges. Uh, this is skiing up Tafel Tinden, which is in the Lingen Alps, and the weather didn't get much better than this, so we weren't blessed with too many good views, but we did get some good skiing on the way down. And uh, the fjords in the, in the area here really are dramatic. As are some of the cornices, as you can see on the left there, this is George leading the troops up. And uh, me up near the summit, not getting too close to that cornice. And then this one was uh, probably the highlight of the trip. We started at about 3 p.m. in a blizzard the weather find up on uh, on cue and then we got to ski down at about 7 p.m. with the midnight sun storms out there over the ocean the North Sea and really good snow and the route you can see up there in the background we got up to a high point there and this was a slope basically all the way down and across a small lake at the bottom and then we're done So that, that's it for the slides. Happy to take any questions. I can see one question uh, about the ballpark cost for this kind of epic. Um,
just in answer to that, um, I wouldn't say it's more expensive than skiing in Europe. And if you go with a guided group, then all costs are included. So you don't have to organise transport, hire cars, buy maps. So it's actually, I think, pretty good value for money. Uh, we also have a question here from Nick, who's uh, asked what time of year and added that uh, there are amazing mountains, which I think we can all concur with. Yeah, so the time of year uh, was April, May, I think late April, early May. I was there for about a month and it coincides with spring. So winter, there's not much daylight and it's, it's a lot colder and I think the better weather in spring is uh, of uh, is worth worth aiming for. Would you uh, would you recommend going any later in the year than you did, or do you think you hit it round about at the peak? Well, I'm thinking April May. Once it starts warming up, it does get surprisingly warm, even up, even up as far as Tromso. So I would probably wouldn't leave it any later than May, but I'd uh, just double check. Seasons vary as well. Yes, yes, obviously. Um, would you try the same trip self-organised as opposed to uh, guided the group to a kind of affair? Yes, I would. Uh, if I had a group of people, probably need at least one, preferably two or three people, a group of four would be ideal to share the, uh, the transport and the costs. But actually organising that stuff, it can work out just as the uh, same price and, and a lot easier if you go with a guided group, if it's the right guided group. Fair enough. What's the, uh, what's the average cost of a beer set you back in Norway? Uh, so beers are expensive. Probably one of the more expensive things you'll buy. There's a tax on alcohol. So I didn't tend to buy very many beers. On the boat, they were provided, um, which was a fringe benefit. And the Swedes like drinking lots of beer. So, um, yeah, beer is one thing I'd be advising to cut back on if you're in Norway. Coffee, not so bad. Uh, soft drinks, not so bad. So stick with Coca-Cola and, uh, and uh, cafe lattes and uh, you'll save a bit of money. Yeah, cool. Uh, Ellen asks, did you take your own skis and, uh, or did you hire there? I think we can extend that to all the technical equipment that you might require. Yeah, so there was the equipment list put around by the uh, company. I took all my own gear. Um, I might have bought a few knickknacks there. There are some good gear shops, but I would recommend taking your own gear because boots need to fit and you need to have, everything needs to basically work and you need to have it dialed in before you go away on a trip like that. I think that's excellent advice. There's nothing worse than uh, breaking new boots in whilst everybody else is uh, raring to go. Hmm. Uh, uh, just following up on the time of year, uh, what's the weather like, particularly around the time that you went? What, what can people expect to uh, experience? Uh, so we had some periods of three or four days where there was fine weather and clear skies. Uh, and then we had a couple of days where there was just low cloud base and really zero visibility. So it can be variable. When you're on the Lofoten Islands, uh, you don't have a lot of options, but when you're up north around Tromso, uh, they were driving us north up to the Lingen Alps if there was a good weather window up there, or south down to uh, Senya, or out to the Kavaloya, the islands uh, named after the, the whale. And um, there's a lot more options in some locations because you can drive to where there might be a better weather pattern with respect to the topography. So it is quite variable and quite technical to actually figure all that out. Uh, and following on from that even further, uh, snowpack conditions. I, uh, I assume it's a maritime snowpack? Yep, yep. You've typically got um, snow conditions similar to Australia. Um, it's not super cold. Uh, further north you go, it gets colder, but um, it's definitely colder than Australia and certainly over the winter, very, very cold. Uh, but yeah, you can get snow turning wet fairly rapidly. And in springtime, you just get the normal spring snow, wet and heavy, and it freeze overnight. So 
similar to what you would get to spring snow skiing conditions here. But we had we were very lucky in that we had a dusting of fresh snow, and we had that stayed for essentially five or six days. So you can get lucky in ski powder there as well at that time of year. Uh, what about other hazards? Uh, I'm particularly thinking about the uh, large cuddly ones that you might find around that uh, part of the world, but uh, any other more exotic things that we might not be used to? Uh, so the moose are technically dangerous, uh, although they're rare. Uh, I wouldn't be getting too close to one, particularly if they've got a calf. There are no polar bears there further north on the island of Svalbard. They aren't actually on the mainland of Norway. Um, so there's no real dangers. Probably the biggest danger would be avalanches. Um, there's no crevasses, no big glaciers or crevasses to worry about in Norway, but avalanches are a concern. When we were there, there was someone skiing on an easy angled slope in uh, hot sunny conditions and they thought it was safe because it was easy angled, but there was a big wet snow slab and that person was unfortunately trapped and didn't survive. And that was up in that um, Romsdalen an area and we were warned when we showed up to locals that I'll oh, be careful we've had a fatality here and uh, we didn't ski that actual slope but it was just an indication that um, you can't take anything for granted in mountains like this and talking to people in shops talking to guides or going on a guide trip particularly if you haven't been to the area before is actually I think a very good idea I think that's probably something that goes for a, uh, a lot of places in the world to be honest uh, and so thank you very much for your time. Uh, two, uh, two excellent presentations today. I'll uh, throw to intermission now if anybody